You know what? We're like bumping up against, I can see the spring break on the horizon. So. I know, it's two days. <laughs> yeah, I'm leaving like a whole four days early. Okay. Yay. I won't be here tonight for 10. Well, Mommy, we'll miss you, but yay for you. And you'll have this unit to exam out of the way. This, this, this class doesn't give a midterm exam per se, yes. but I figure our second unit exam is something I can conclude on your midterm grades. So we don't have an official midterm exam, just a second unit exam next week. Okay. All right. So on the previous slide, actually you have, um, and it, it didn't make it to the test this semester, but I love the word Bergeron. Bergeron process is basically the formation of snow. And we spent a little time uh, Monday, or this is, we spent a little time on Wednesday, this is Friday. We spent a little time on Wednesday talking about the, showing kind of the, the ice crystal falling through um, air that has um, water vapor and it has that super cooled liquid water, okay? And the deal is, is that the water vapor prefers to go with the ice crystal. So the ice crystal gets bigger and the super cooled liquid water actually kind of gives more water vapor to the environment that the snowflakes falling through. Snow is a complicated thing, okay? And this actually talks a little bit more about snow. Um, so one of the things you know is when the snow gets here to the ground, sometimes um, they'll kind of be kind of pieces stuck together. I kind of think of that as accretion. They kind of mix and match as they fall through the cloud. Um, now, uh, this Bergeron process occurs in what we call cold clouds. And actually today we're going to mix up, that's cold clouds. Why is it cold? Because it's temperatures that are uh, where water will solidify. Okay, freezing temperatures. We're going to also hit cool clouds and warm clouds coming up here in a minute. Okay, so um, the next few slides actually kind of talk you through if you have snow made in the cloud, okay, what is it going to be when it gets to the Earth's surface? Okay, is it going to be snow? Is it going to melt along the way and be rain? Okay, and then actually two other types of precipitation I want to kind of describe to you are what we call freezing rain and sleet. Okay, what's it going to be when, from these cold clouds? Well, it depends. What it depends on is what is the temperature doing. So actually, I like these figures, what your, what your author has done. Anytime you see pink here, that means that the temperature is warmer than the freezing point temperature. So basically, this is showing a cold cloud, the Bergeron process. You get your snow, okay, it hits this warmer air because we know that actually in the troposphere, usually, the temperatures get colder as you go up. So you can have warm air down there, okay? So it melts. And this over here actually is showing you kind of what the weather balloon, that, that environmental lapse rate. This is like the environmental lapse rate. It's saying it's cold up here, okay, and gets warm here. So we definitely have rain. This is what we call the, the, the temperature profile or what the temperature would be like to give us rain. Well, to give us snow, okay, it's not that much different, but you don't see any pink. Okay, that just means that it's, it's colder than the freezing point temperature all the way down. Okay, and you can kind of see that over here. Okay, so that makes sense. Now the last two kind of go together. Uh, if you're like me, you get kind of uh, um, antsy when you hear the, that we're going to have freezing rain events. And so with these next two, they kind of go together. This is sleet, sometimes called ice pellets. And notice what's different here. We basically have this warm air kind of inserted, and we're going to talk later on kind of how that happens, but inserted between cold air and cold air. So it starts out as snow, it melts in the pink area, and then it refreezes down here. This is what we call a temperature inversion. I think we've looked at those before. Okay, so this is where, this is what your weather balloon says over here. And instead of basically getting warmer, 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 as you get closer to the earth, basically it has, it gets warmer, okay, and then it gets colder. That is your temperature inversion right there. So it can be 14 degrees air temperature at the surface and be sleep? Um, yeah. Yeah, so what he's saying is it's weird to think it can be so cold here, okay, you're like, well, my goodness, 14 degrees Fahrenheit, it should have, the snow should have made it here. Well, it didn't make it here because it hit a pocket of warm air, and it, it uh, melted into liquefied. And you figure between where it melted and the ground, 
the be it can't do the Bergeron process because that's pretty complicated. The best it can do is basically pelletalize. Yeah. And that would happen like if there's a really strong like southwest wind or I don't know if I'd go that far, but it's possible that they could coincide. Yeah. But you need a temperature inversion for sure. Temperature inversion, the wind direction, not sure if I can really say. So look at the similarities between that was sleet, this is freezing rain. If you're if you're if you weren't fast, I'll go back and forth. That's sleet. Okay, that's freezing rain. Go back and forth one more time. Sleet, freezing rain. So look at this one. Look at this. They both have a, t a kink. They both have a temperature inversion. But the freezing, or excuse me, the sleet has a really deep temperature inversion. It has time to pelletalize. Last time, I promise. <laughs> this is freezing rain. Notice that actually it doesn't really have time to pelletalize. That's a real word or not. <laughs> I'm using this one. <laughs> okay. So it starts out as snow. It melts, to liquefies, okay. And instead of pelletalizing, basically it's cold down here. It's 23 degrees Fahrenheit. It basically freezes on contact. It freezes on cold things. Uh, on the right figure, uh, is the y-axis uh, altitude then? That yes. Okay. Yep. This is elevation. Yep. Mm -hmm. And it's the temperature at the different elevations, yep. So again, we have a kink. Um, instead of getting warmer and warmer and warmer as it approaches the Earth's surface, it actually gets warmer and then it gets colder. Okay, and it's warmer here to the point of melting that snow. Okay, so that's kind of how that works. They both sleet and freezing rain need a temperature inversion in place. Okay, cool. I really like this figure. This is like new to this edition. This has everything. <laughs> okay, we've been talking, and we're going to switch it up here in a minute, but we've been talking about cold clouds. Cold clouds, basically, you have the Bergeron process going on. You're cre creating snow. And then what happens to that snow depends, or what we're going to see it as depends. So in this first scenario, basically, it falls the snow, it melts, and we get rain. In this scenario right here, um, it falls the snow, it melts, uh, to liquid water, and there's not much time for it to go ahead and to re-solidify here. So this is where you're going to get your freezing rain. This is pretty shallow, and actually you'll hear meteorologists use the word temp shallow temperature inversion. This one has a deep temperature inversion, where basically we have snow. It um, Here it melts to liquefy the snow, the cute little snowflakes, and here it's going to freeze again, but it has time to go ahead and to pelletalize as a deep temperature inversion. Then over here, basically you have snow all the way. Um, now, uh, I'll kind of draw your attention. Do you remember we talked about um, uh, weather fronts? And actually, if you have just simply warm air, warm air, and we're going to call this overriding, going up and over cold air, Okay, this is describing a weather front in a sense, isn't it? You could remember weather fronts deal with air masses, and we'll talk more about air masses, just a chunk of air. So basically you have a chunk of warm air here, a chunk of cold air here. You could kind of have go, going up and over, and you have your temperature inversion. Okay. So uh, freezing rain and sleet. Okay. So they both require a temperature inversion, but sleet has a deeper temperature inversion. It has more time to go ahead and make little pellets. This is actually showing you a terrible freezing rain event. I know, that is not good. I feel like I wouldn't even make it. Yeah, I don't think, I, I don't do ice. <laughs> I don't do ice. Meteorologists sometimes call freezing rain glaze. And sometimes they call sleet ice pellets. So is hail, this might be a dumb question, so the big chunks of hail, like they talk about big chunks of hail at quarter size. Big chunks of hail. That's just when the snow and then the warm air in it? No, I'm glad you mentioned that because hail, um, hail is a very exciting event, and actually it's coming up in our notes. Oh. Hail has nothing to do with snow. Um, sleet and freezing rain has to do with snow. It starts out as snow, it melts, and then it refreezes. Hail, we're going to see, actually, is associated with storm clouds. Is that what you're... Oh. 
So then, is it freezing rain that is causing like the power outages? Can be, yep, because you can kind of see how it lays heavy on that. We don't really get snow, we get ice. That's not good. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but Tulsa? we always okay. Got ice. Okay. Um, and I was just wondering, because they always say one to two inches of ice, and mm -hmm. like, is that sweet or is that going to be freezing rain? Um, one to two inches of ice. That, that would be your freezing that's rain. Sweet, right? No, I think they would say they would say sleet if it's like ice so pellets. It, yeah, if they say one to two inches of ice, that means freezing rain. That that's yeah. and actually, I think my notes say something about the super cooled water. So actually, that's part of our problem sometimes with a shallow, um, a very shallow temperature inversion, is it has um, liquefied and it's trying to refreeze. And it can do that, but it, it basically is super cooled liquid water. And if you go ahead and run into that with your car, or if that thing splashes on the ground, it takes it out of being super cooled and it just solidifies. So it freezes on contact. Mm -hmm. so, so when, yeah. We get more glaze. We get more, okay, in Tulsa? Okay. Yeah, you, if you get more glaze, glaze is worse. Because sleet, you're like, eh, you can almost kind of handle it, like with snow. You just get out your shovel. And, and sleet is bumpy, so actually you can walk on sleet, you know? Yeah, well, ice, you cannot walk on ice. So do they have a lot of cancellations and stuff? When oh, they, yeah. Yeah? We, I went two days without power before. So I, I think what happens with the power, don't you, is like... It, it just bends the power lines. Yeah, it, yeah. It's a, it weights them down. And, oh, yeah. yeah, it bends them, and they can't take it. My dad doesn't like freezing rain. He's a journeyman every time oh. he hears it, he goes, I'm going to get called in. <laughs> He's going to get called in for yeah. working those, yeah. Not good. Not good. Okay, so that was cold clouds. Um, and one of the things I'd like to kind of convince you of is in the springtime and the fall time probably, um, a lot, or maybe even in the summertime, what we get is rain. A lot of times starts out as snow. It just you know, kind of falls through and warms up and it melts. So that's kind of neat. It starts out as snow. It just melts on the way down. <laughs> um, so, but changing it up from the warm clouds, of course, the warm clouds, you're not going to have super cooled water. Warm clouds, by definition, would just be simply, it's condensed and in an environment that is warmer than the temp freezing temperature of water, Okay. So instead of that, you have to switch gears. And actually, this really happens a lot in the tropics all year round. If you have, and by the way, so here's the equator. And one of the things we're going to talk about is actually the equator not only, well, it's very warm. It's relatively warm throughout the year, okay? Um, and the heat and all that, actually, it's, a lot of times it has constant clouds. So we have a sort of... You know, your rainforests and that sort of thing are mostly... So, would a hurricane form from a warm cloud? So, hurricanes are most likely forming from warm clouds. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, these are warm clouds. And uh, the water condenses um, from a vapor to a liquid. And I'm going to kind of describe how you get the liquid particles big enough to fall from the clouds. And it's called collision coalescence. So... Um, kind of show you how that works. But in order to kind of make sense of the whole collision coalescence process, I need to talk about something that's not just unique to falling water. It's, you, it's anything falling actually will go faster and faster and faster. It's the acceleration due to gravity. And I'll try to kind of show you what this has to do with the collision and coalescence process in a warm cloud in a minute. So basically if I drop this pen, okay, it it looks like it's going like the same speed as it falls, but if we could go ahead and at any point see how fast it's going, it's going faster and faster and faster and faster. Okay, it starts out at a certain speed, it goes faster and faster and faster. That's because of gravity. Okay, um, it's 9.8 um, meters per second is how fast it accelerates for every second it falls. Maybe you guys, 9.8 meters per second squared sort of thing. Um, but objects, including this pen, will max out they'll come to what's called a terminal velocity. They'll max out at how fast they're going to go. And if the Earth didn't have an atmosphere, that wouldn't be the case. It's the, actually the gas particles in the atmosphere that cause a drag to your falling object. Okay? So the maximum velocity is related to kind of the, the aerodynamics of the object and the mass of the object. 
So I mention all of that because we're going to see an assortment of liquid water droplets falling through these warm clouds. And the more massive ones, actually we're going to call those collector droplets, the more massive it is, the faster it falls, the faster its terminal velocity. Okay, that's just it. That's just it. So that's kind of shown here. So where we have an increasing size, they're getting larger and larger, and you can actually see we have an increasing speed at which they fall. I mean, a good thing to kind of think about is if, you th if you've ever looked at fog, before. Actually, fog sometimes, if you stand in fog, you can actually kind of see the little mist particles kind of just, that's their terminal velocity. Okay. And that makes a difference. And I'll kind of show you how that works. So the collision coalescence process. How do you measure a raindrop? How do you measure how fast it's falling or the size? Um, I would think so. Maybe Oh, photography and then run it through computers? That's a good question. Yeah. <laughs> um, but in order, if you go back to kind of the fog thing, you know, fog's like just barely moving like that, you're like, dude, that's so, if that was a cloud, like if that was a, sort of some sort of cumulus cloud, that would take like forever for that stuff to reach the earth. You know what I'm saying? Okay. So they have to get bigger. And how do they get bigger? collision coalescence process is what makes them bigger. So they need to actually get 100 times larger than they start out and significantly more massive than they start out. Okay, so collision coalescence. So this actually, I guess it's on the next slide coming up. And if you're familiar with the term collide, that's where collision is. So basically, we're going to have this big droplet falling through. We're going to call it the granddaddy that's going to fall from the cloud as a rain droplet. And it's going to collide with the little ones. Why? Because it's going faster. Now, this actually talks about um, the whole droplet that's colliding. It is a little tricky because... I think if you guys have those words, I'm going to go to the next slide. The reason it's a little tricky as it falls through, try, so the big one, you guys see the big one? That's the one that's going to fall as a rain droplet. It's going faster than the little ones. So we have collision of the big one with the little ones. The word coalesce means to kind of gel. So basically it's gobbling up. The big one's gobbling up the little ones. But it is a little bit problematic because, and we'll talk more about pressure, but have you ever tried to, if there's like a, a piece of lint or something falling and you're like, oh, that's so troublesome, or a piece of feather or something, I'm going to so grab that. So um, you go to grab it and it scoots away from you. <laughs> so what you've done when you went, honestly, to grab it is you, in the motion of grabbing it, you created a high pressure right in front of your hand. So this high pressure right in front of your hand created a wind to scoot away from. So that's kind of what the collector droplets are up against. But they do are they do collectively they do successfully collide and coalesce. All right. So this is kind of this is back to a figure from your textbook. Kind of a rain droplet. It's got a faster terminal velocity than the smaller ones around it. Okay. So it can go ahead collide and coalesce into something larger. This actually kind of shows you, or maybe this next one does. This last one, or the last two, kind of show you the, it getting larger. And then this one right here, as it gets large and it's <coughs> falling through, it gets kind of floppy. And actually, I've kind of seen videos um, slowed down to kind of show this process. And as it kind of flops around, it can actually break apart. Now, it used to be one. Now, it's five. Now, these five can fall through and go ahead and be their own collector droplets. So that's what's happening in warm clouds, collision coalescence. Okay, um, so we talked about cold clouds. That's the Bergeron process. Now, something between cold and warm would be cool. <laughs> so cool clouds, you might already kind of have an idea of what they are. Cool clouds start out as snow at the top of the cloud, and then kind of halfway down the cloud, it's warmer. So then you have the rain. You have the collision coalescence process. So... All right.
right. So kind of some miscellaneous things here. I don't know if you've ever kind of seen, I'll kind of dim the lights, these sort of formations. You might kind of say, well, it looks like it's, especially this, one, this kind of dark blue one up here, doesn't it look like it's dropping its precipitation? But if you were to go ahead and you were to be here, okay, there's a good chance that you would not need an umbrella because it's not making it to the ground. Okay, so if this is rain, we actually call this Virga. Okay, so the reason actually it doesn't make it to the ground is because the air is very dry. So if the air is very dry, then as it falls in its liquid state, it basically evaporates before it reaches the ground. These are kind of a similar thing. Okay, and you can kind of see them kind of dripping here. These are called fall streaks. And of course, we call it when it goes from a solid like snow to water vapor, we call that um, sublimation, or if you remember that, it skips the liquid stage. And that also happens when the air is dry. Okay. So a uh, table from your textbook that kind of talks about, we haven't talked about all of these yet, but different types of precipitation, their size, their name, their description. All right, so a little more about snow, just a little more about snow, because we're kind of leading up, leading up to um, how do you measure precipitation. Well, actually, a few things. So snow has that cool six-sided appearance just because of how liquid water or how water hydrogen bonds to other water molecules. Okay. All snowflakes are unique. This down here alludes to something that, um, you know, living in the Midwest you're kind of familiar with. Sometimes we have powdery snows and sometimes we have kind of those wet snows. It depends upon temperature. So kind of from left to right, we have the warmer temperatures and we have the colder temperatures over there at the right. Kind of what your different snowflakes. Some pretty pictures. Mm. Have you ever been able to catch it on camera? I've tried. Uh, not really. I've tried too. They melt. <laughs> <laughs> oh, very pretty. OK, so now on to hail. So we talked about 10 cloud types, and the type of cloud that gives you hail is the cumulonimbus cloud. Cumulonimbus means the ones that have gr great, crazy vertical development. Cumulonimbus clouds are the storm clouds. Okay, So cumulonimbus clouds um, would be relatively, I would say warm clouds. I think they'd be warm clouds. So what happens is uh, basically, Whenever you have a storm cloud, and we just talked about that, that storm spotter training, okay, whenever you have a, a, a mature uh, cumulonimbus cloud, you have what we call an updraft. Can you guys see the updraft? Okay. And you have a downdraft. Okay. So what happens is, and I'm going to throw one more particle at you. It seems like I maybe mentioned this the other day, grapple. Mm -hmm. Where is a grapple we have? Okay. So grapple is kind of an ugly, kind of deformed sort of um, snow. Well, that's hail. That's hail, actually. Okay. So grapple actually, somewhere in here, can get lifted up. Okay. In the updraft, it falls down the downdraft. Now, the thing is, it can actually go ahead and scoot over and catch the updraft again. And it can fall down the downdraft, catch the updraft, fall down the downdraft updraft, okay? So what I've kind of shown you is kind of a piece of hail that's finally maybe going to fall from the cloud, make several trips up and around, several trips up and around. And as it does so, it gets coated with more uh, super cooled water. Okay, so it goes up, down, up, down, up, down. And then when it finally gets um, large enough, it will fall 
from a certain region, it would be hail. <laughs> so hail is much different than sleet. Okay. What's the biggest recorded? What's that? What's the biggest hailstorm recorded? I don't know. That's a good question. The biggest hailstorm okay. recorded. Baseball size hail. Baseball size. Baseball size. That's scary. I remember reading. They have reported softball size in the past. Not good. I remember reading it was in Aurora, uh, Nebraska. I think it was in, I don't remember how long ago, but it was volleyball size so hail. Oh. <laughs> wow. Volleyball that size hail, that's not that's, good. <laughs> that would take out a car. Volleyball size hail. <laughs> that's not good. I would not want to be with that. I think it was Michael Bear's next and so we talked about terminal velocities, and so they are going very fast when they fall. Were you going to say something, Kay? And they heard the pink, strong, warm updraft. Uh -huh. Does it just stay where it is because it's got the updraft from the right and then it comes up and over? Yeah, generally speaking, the, she's asking, does the pink, strong updraft in a storm cloud, does it <coughs> kind of stay where it is? Um, sort of. Um, it actually, this cloud probably will be moving and it will stay kind of in kind of the same relative position, but the whole cloud will move. So yeah. Okay. Did you, did you find something? Maybe? The largest hailstone in terms of diameter and weight was on July 23rd, 2010 in Vivian, South Dakota, and it was 7.9 inches in diameter. Whoa! 18.62 inches in circumference, and it weighed almost 2 pounds. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Kathunk in South Dakota, you said? Where was yep. it? There you go. Thanks. 2010? Ooh. Yep. I was in uh, Sturgis, South Dakota, and they had like golf ball size, like frequently, twice a week. Sturgis, isn't that where the, um, the, rally. the Harley people go? Yeah. yeah. That's why I was there. <laughs> With your bikes and everything? That's no, not good. I, oh. My parents were vendors. Oh, okay. I was there for like three weeks. <laughs> Yeah, we'll Dang. Just sure yeah, sounds like it. That's cool. But have you guys noticed too, like this year is in the whole tornado thing? I mean, we're having an early season for mm. the South and tornadoes. Well, tornadoes went through Pennsylvania and Virginia. This year already? Yeah. There's already been two in Oklahoma this year. That's not good. They were within uh, three hours of each other. My goodness. <laughs> It's only February, you know. I know. That's why I'm like, oh, I'm going to hate being down there for spring break. <laughs> the spring, they're saying it's going to be, it's going to shift to a little Nino. Okay, yeah, that's what I heard. It's, good. it's shifting from El, La, El Nino to La Nina. That's good. Um, I'd have to look it up, but um, it's a global thing. It's like a whole earth thing. So what would it do? Well, like I said, I'd have to look it up, but it changes the weather, the general weather patterns. What's that? Oh, let's finish. Let's let's finish chapter five. <laughs> so this is fancy frost. Remember the other day when we had that fog event, and I said if you looked at the trees, you'd see kind of this, like kind of the white on the trees. Um, so rime is just fancy frost. So one of these days you're going to look and you're going to say, Mrs. Snipes said that's just fancy frost. <laughs> okay. And there's something called hoar frost, which is kind of similar to rime, I think. What's but um, I, I showed you a picture the other day, the hoar frost. They're similar, yeah. Um, but the, the thing about it, it's not normal frost in that um, sometimes it can be associated with fog. Um, but basically we have a whole crap load of super cool liquid water that wants to go ahead and deposit on things. So, all right. Um, just actually after the, um, the spotter training event I went to, actually during the spotter training event, uh, because I had Wi-Fi connection, I went ahead and ordered a, a rain gauge, because anybody in here for a rain gauge? Okay, so I don't know. It just seems like we should have, yeah. We should all have rain gauges. Um, I ordered off of Amazon, so I bet they do. I bet they do. So there's kind of different types of rain gauges. There's a simple one. There's a standard one that actually kind of adds a funnel to it. The tipping uh, bucket gauge and the weighing gauge, actually those would be kind of in your ASOSs. Remember we said that some places need to automatically measure, like, the weather. And those actually could kind of go and do it for you. So the first one is a simply ga simple gauge. 
Um, the second one actually, like I said, adds a funnel, and then the gradations need to be kind of correct for the funnel. Okay. Um, the last two are fancier, so you probably would be associated with the uh, um, National Weather Service to have one of these two or one of this one. I guess that's the same one. But the tipping uh, bucket one says that actually it will fill up and then it will see you. Have a good weekend. When it gets uh, full enough, it will tip over and dump, and it actually then it'll fill up again, tip, fill up again, tip, and it counts how many tips, and it knows how much water each tip. So that's kind of how they go. Okay. So uh, when they report the amount of rainfall, there's always a little bit of play. There's a little bit of play in everything that you measure, including um, um, the inches of water you got. Usually though it's going to be biased low. So um, so measuring snow. Measuring snow is a tricky thing too. Um, you can measure how deep the snow is but if the snow is blowing at all you're like dude where do you want me to measure from? <laughs> right? So blowing snow is really hard. Sometimes they will take the, um, the snow and go ahead and melt it down. Like take a column of snow and then melt it and convert it to liquid water. Okay, and so they have the what they call the liquid water equivalents. Okay, which you guys may have, if you're like me, um, this is inches of snow, inches snow, and this is inches of rain. So I don't know if you're like me, but do you, have you ever heard kind of the 10 to 1? So like for every one inch of liquid rain, it would, if it was doing the Bergeron process, you get 10 inches of snow. But there's definitely a range to that. I mean, it can range anywhere from 30 inches of snow for every one inch of rain to only four inches of snow for every one inch. I don't know. So it's higher. It's you get more um, snow. You get deeper snow. I wonder if it's just kind of it's it's not a fine snow. It's a a poopy snow. That's interesting. This semester, this kind of new to this edition was um, this idea. Um, your textbook says that, like on mountains, that actually the the snow that they get is really important to their water supply. So they track snow very carefully, and um, this is measuring snow by having a scale under here. So like under here, oops, like under here you can kind of see the dent. There's actually a scale there. So they basically get the weight, because you know snow can be really heavy <laughs> if you've ever like had to shovel snow, okay? So basically they get the weight of the snow and then they convert that to liquid water and they kind of know how much they can keep track of their water that way. And that's kind of cool. This has been a big deal in California because they had very little snow. In California? Not this winter, but last winter. Okay. So they had a severe drought in Southern California because that's where they get their water from. So like in the, in the winter time when it snows, they're counting on that to carry them through the year? Mm-hmm. Yeah. How did it look for this year? Was our snowfall better? The snowfall was better this year. That's good. Not normal, but better okay. than it had been. And actually, the, you asked about El Nino, La Nina, and that's one of the broad trends that can go yeah. with that pattern, is this where the snow is going to fall dump and not dump. So, um, all right. Another way, actually, so measuring precipitation using a rain gauge is, is awesome. But meteorologists, and, and if you go to spotter training, they will ask you if you will do that for them. So I'm thinking about doing that for them. I just look at my rain gauge, I'll call it in. I think it would be too bad. But this is another way of, of checking precipitation. So you guys have seen these before. This is a radar. We'll be looking more at what radars do. But radars rely on basically, um, and, and the guy, the, tree, uh, the, the National Weather Service guy talked about how there are limitations of radar because radar basically sends out a signal and if there's no precipitation, the signal doesn't come back. If there is precipitation, they get what's called an echo. Okay, so it's raining, it comes back. Okay, depending upon how much it's raining, a lot of it comes back. 
So this is actually, it's important to have a clear view between the radar and the precipitation. So the angrier the color, the more red it is, the more the return signal. So that's how that goes. And I'll probably mention this before, but I kind of told you, you get a sense for how close the radar has to be to the precipitation. So um, if you see, like, I mean, gosh, this covers how many states? Okay, this is a lot of radar information. These things are like networked together. So these are multiple stations kind of giving a composite view. I think that is so cool, you know. Meteorologists can play well together. <laughs> okay. Um, so on to this idea of weather modification. It almost sounds sci-fi-ish, weather modification. It sounds evil. <laughs> you know. <laughs> like, um, but... And it kind of is. It's actually, uh, I have a slide to say it's cool. the ethics are kind of, you know, you got to be careful about that whole thing, weather modification. Um, there's been movies written about modifying the weather. Mm -hmm. But um, examples of modifying the weather is you could strategically kind of use a dark color to kind of, you know, absorb more uh, radiation from the sun and to kind of get some sort of pattern going that way. We kind of... Um, Inadvertently, for instance, modified, I'd say modified the weather um, back in the Dust Bowl days, and we'll be actually kind of talking about that, where we over-farmed our, uh, uh, I don't know, you wouldn't call that Midwest, you'd call that, you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, over-farmed this region over here, okay, modifying the weather. Um, but we can purposely modify the weather, too. And here's an example, cloud seeding. So in cloud seeding, it's kind of like, remember we said that cloud condensation nuclei, the CCN, we have um, the, the cloud condensation nuclei um, that are hygroscopic. They love getting the party started. So actually what you do with cloud seeding is to kind of spray, it's like a crop duster. You spray um, cloud condensation nuclei, hoping to, to get condensation to begin. Um, so that's somewhat successful, and the slide kind of says that's somewhat successful. You figure, though, even if you get the initial little little tiny rain droplet to form, it's still got that, if it's a warm cloud, collision coalescence process to successfully go through in order to get a raindrop. Okay, or if it's a cold cloud, it has the Bergeron process that needs to continue. So cloud seeding isn't as obvious as you might think uh, a solution. Um, and at the bottom here it says, and Kay was just at, you know, mentioning about the drought in the West. You know, if you go ahead and make the clouds dump their precip on you, then downstream those folks might be used to, might not like that. <laughs> okay, so. Um, okay. So um, we were talking about hail and appreciated uh, maybe looking up the biggest hail that we've ever had. This actually is showing you what hail can do to tiny little growing plants, especially at the wrong time. Okay, yeah. I know. They didn't even get a chance. <laughs> and um, as far as trying to um, control the weather and trying to control or suppress a hail event, actually there is some folks that have worked on that. This right here, this I kind of brought this, I don't think this figure is in your textbook anymore, this photo. But this photo right here is showing you an old-timey, you can tell it's old-timey by what they're wearing. This actually was, looks like a snake oil salesman sort of ding going on there. <laughs> Basically to create loud noises to disturb the formation of hail so that you would not get this. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it works, <laughs> but people may have bought it. But there are, there are some possibilities with trying to uh, suppress hail, um, dealing with seeding the clouds. So I'm just going to throw that out there. Um, so is this the last slide? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Now, you can't necessarily, well, yes, you can. You can actually, if you wanted to suppress dew or frost, you know, there are things that you could do. You could try to not get, have it get so cold, not to reach the dew point or the frost point temperature. These actually, we haven't had the whole citrus problem for a while. Remember some years we have the Florida, um, you know, they got their, um, 
their fruit is growing and it's in a very uh, compromise, it can be compromised by when the frost comes. But ways of trying to make it so frost won't get your fruit, you could actually um, electronically kind of mix the air, warm and cold. Um, this one, these are ash pots to kind of make a blanket. So actually throughout the course of the evening, instead of losing that radiation that the earth is oozing off, try to kind of keep it associated with the earth. This one is, I think, interesting. This one actually suggests that you go out and you purposefully you dose or you go ahead and on the surface of your citrus fruit put liquid water knowing that it's going to freeze and as it freezes as it goes from a liquid to a solid it's going to release a little bit of energy that's kind of weird but yeah so it's a thought so let's take a quick look at chapter five homework i don't think it was let's see what you think so chapter five will be due on when we meet on wednesday so here's the first question for chapter five. It's a question about cloud types. So you're supposed to tell me which sort of cloud types will give you halos, which sort of cloud types will give you light to moderate precipitation. It's got to be a nimbo sort of cloud for the B, right? Which ones give you hail? Um, cumulonimbus, yep. The macro sky, do you remember what that one is? Anybody remember macro sky? Um, macro sky, it's high. Is so. Zero cumulus, yep. Macro sky is zero cumulus. Uh, what about the mare's tail? Cirrus. Cirrus. Yep. Very good. Mare's tail is cirrus. Um, oops, come back. The next question looks like this. Okay. The next two questions are five and eight. So just yeah, you don't have to do six and seven. So five looks like this. Why does radiation fog form mainly on clear nights um, instead of when there's clouds? So radiation fog. Because what? Because the clouds are a warming effect. That's right, because the clouds are a warming effect. Yep, the clouds are a warming effect. I like it. Um, <coughs> for D, or excuse me, for 8, says describe or sketch uh, what the temperature needs to be in order to give you snow, rain, and freezing rain. Okay, so snow, it's got to be, what, cold all the way down, um, all the way, and rain, it needs to melt to reach the ground, and freezing rain, do you remember what freezing rain and sleet need? It's in the middle. The it's, warm air is in the middle. It, the warm air is in the middle, right. Exactly. Or do we just do one of those... Yeah, I kind of would do a graph thingy or describe it either way. And then we have this one. Now, number nine, it has parts A, B, and C, but number nine, I'll deal with this graph. Now, um, I kind of wrote over it, but see where um, the real temperature is the red. So the red is what the temperature of the air is. The blue is what the dew point temperature is. And remember, dew point temperature is always a little bit colder than your real temperature. Okay, so A says, at what altitude would clouds be found, or at what altitude would clouds be found? Oh, and it gives you some options. So clouds need to be, clouds need to be found where your real temperature is your dew point temperature. So do you see where I've circled in purple there? Yeah. So I'm kind of liking between four to eight. Yep, me too. The next one, what would this cloud consist of? Would it be liquid? Would it be ice? Or would it be both? And my, my hint there is to look at what, yeah, I'm like an ice because look at what the temperature is. Yep. And then the last one is if this cloud goes ahead and dumps, what would it be when it reaches the Earth's surface? I'm thinking snow, too. Yep. And one more question. That looks like this. Okay, remember we said Virga and fall streaks are basically the cloud is dumping, but it evaporates before it reaches the ground. And so this says, why wouldn't you have Virga and fog? 
happen at the same time. Well, what does fog need? What does fog is the air is like saturated. Fog, the air is saturated. Yep. And what is Virga needs? Dry. Dry. Yep. And they're they're at odds. Yep. Virga needs dry air, and fog needs saturated air. Very good. So you guys just collectively did your homework. Okay. So awesome. So when we meet on Wednesday, oh, I wanted to give you, because um, some of you guys might want them, your.